Hello. Welcome to the Comments Collaborative Project Espresso Global and Ukrainian Media. I'm Olena Solodovnikova, and it's great pleasure for me to welcome David Satter, an American journalist and writer. Hello, David. Hi, glad to be with you. Uh, the same. Uh, David, many experts expected Putin to win the major military victory in Ukraine to succeed in elections, but that didn't happen. Why? Or was it different version uh, sold to the Russians? Uh, in general, how do military victories in Ukraine now affect Putin's power? Well, the why uh, is a question uh, that it can be answered by the Ukrainian general staff and the uh, Ukrainian military. Uh, they carefully prepared, they, they realized that aggression was coming, or at least that aggression was possible, and they prepared for that possibility. Whereas the Russians, uh, and I believe this, I believe Putin as well, did not understand the degree to which uh, corruption had uh, weakened the, the, the Russian military, and the degree to which uh, the organization of the Russian military was inappropriate for the kind of war that they were going to have to fight. So for those reasons, uh, Ukraine uh, in the first months of the war uh, achieved remarkable victories. And in a sense, they, they you know, facing a much larger and more, more numerous opponent, uh, they continue to demonstrate their their skill, because the fight is is uneven. Uh, I think it's the task of the West now to try to make that fight more even by providing Ukraine with the with the armaments that it needs. But there's no uh, uh, no denying the skill of the Ukrainian armed forces and the achievement of holding back Russia, even to the degree of that they have. Yes, but do you think now ordinary Russians, uh, uh, they think that uh, they are winning the war with uh, Ukraine? Uh, what about uh, their propaganda? It's hard to, hard to say what they think. Uh, and what they think can change. Uh, this is a population that is really under the influence of mass propaganda and of course their own national chauvinism. The very common uh, view in Russia that, well, maybe the war was a mistake, but now that we're in it, we have to win. In fact, that was the attitude of a lot of people during the Chechen wars. Uh, they can't bear the idea that Russia can be defeated by a smaller country. And yet they see that that's what's, ha what's uh, beginning to happen or what, what appeared to be happening. Right now, uh, I think it's very dangerous to make predictions. The uh, It probably was uh, unwise to assume that a Ukrainian victory was inevitable after the first victories uh, uh, in, you know, around Kharkov and uh, Dnipro. But the, um, the fact is, that uh, uh, we the, the most important factor in this war, what people are thinking in the Russian armed forces, what the average soldier is thinking, what is going on in the depths of Russian society, these are things that we'll only know uh, when a crisis takes place and the, and the, uh, the true attitude is manifested. Nobody could have predicted, for example, that Prigozhin, uh, the head of the Wagner group, uh, would successfully march his soldiers in 24 hours, 450 miles, almost to within uh, a striking distance of Moscow, and that people along the way would, would, would indicate their support. So uh, that's an indication that below the surface, there may be processes taking, pro taking place that, that we're unaware of. But will, but will will make themselves felt 
uh, in the months and years to come, depending on how long this war goes on. Uh, but what do you think about the Russian militias units? Uh, can they successfully change anything on the battlefield or in the thinking of Russians who are expertised the war as uh, is it happening now on Belgorod and some other places? I mean, uh, voluntary uh, units uh, which uh, belong to the Ukrainian army officially, Erdeka and uh, Siberian uh, units. Oh, you others. mean the Russians who are fighting on the side yeah. of of, yep. of Ukraine? Yep. Uh, and how effective are they likely to be? Yep. Is that the question? Yep. Well, uh, one doesn't wasn't one doesn't know. I mean, they're small groups at the present time. Uh, whether they would make a difference or not, I I've I've heard different. I've heard various reports. Uh, about them but in fact they will i don't think they will be decisive it will what will be decisive is the performance of the organized ukrainian military uh which uh, has fought very well has had western training uh needs modern arms which i hope the west will provide and uh uh certainly uh does not lack for the one thing that the russians uh don't have a need, which is fighting spirit and dedication. Yes, but uh, you um, talk about Prigozhin rebel. Do you think, uh, was it uh, fake rebel? And uh, can someone suddenly repeat Prigozhin's uh, actions and actually attack Moscow? I think it's difficult now because uh, Prigozhin had his own private army, uh, which 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 was subordinate to him and which believed in him, and and that's one of the reasons why he was eliminated. But there could be, you know, we don't know what's going on in the ranks of the general staff in in Moscow. We don't know how loyal uh, Putin's commanders are. We don't know if there isn't uh, a group that feels that Russia has suffered enough in this war and that the war is being fought not for Russia, but for Putin. And therefore it's important to remove Putin. We we just don't know. We don't have any insight into that. I mean, no one in the on the allied side during the second world war uh, knew in advance about the attempt to kill Hitler in 1944. They learned about it after the fact. And so, uh, we 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 need to continue to resist aggression on the basis of a feeling that um anything can happen and that we're we're you know, and if fortune will will rule in favor of of ukraine it will be because uh ukraine gave fortune a certain amount of help. Yeah, but uh, if could we imagine that this offensive against uh, uh, Moscow will be successful, uh, what we need after that? I mean, uh, seizing power for the short term uh, is not an option for a long term. Do you think you think you're you're saying that Moscow, that Russia could be successful in a major offensive? No, no, no. I mean, vice versa. Why vice versa? If somebody the like a black swan will be successful in offensive to Moscow, and after that they need seizing power in Russia, uh, how uh, they should uh, do? If uh, if there's a successful Ukrainian attack on Russia, a Ukrainian and, uh, attack or. Russian uh, units uh, or Ukrainian somebody. allied Russians uh, you know what what it's it's the realm of speculation we just don't know we just don't know what what would happen and how people how loyal are people to the Putin regime well we know that that there are a certain number of a certain percentage of the population are fully a supportive of Putin because they have an imperialist mentality. Yep. Uh, there are others who who are not so supportive but believe 
that Russia has no choice to con but co to continue because losing the war would be a disaster. And then there are other people who, who either have no opinion or are opposed, but we don't know the balance. And uh, the balance is, is important. And particularly when we talk about the armed services, you know, the armed forces or the KGB or the FSB. Uh, but uh, this is something that that the Ukrainian armed forces, that Ukraine is not really able to influence. I think the attitude should be uh, that uh, you know we hope you know we hope we hope that resistance will break, but we can't control it. And the important thing is to to win back territory. Yeah, but uh, talking about the psychology of Russians at all, uh, what do you think, uh, what exactly has changed in the behavior of Russians in the 10 years since you were kicked off from Russia? Have they become more bloodthirsty? It seems that the uh, I think they Russians... Became... Oh, sorry, yes, yes, sorry. I think they became more insecure. I oh. think that after, as a result of the uh, Maidan revolt... They remember that we had on the streets of Kiev 200, 300,000 people uh, in Maidan, on the Khrushchev, and you know, uh, and the um, I think that this made the Russian leaders very nervous, very uncertain about their own hold on power. And these aggressive actions were undertaken because this this was a way of rallying the population around these corrupt crooks who run the place. Uh, but um, what about that connection that uh, Russians uh, uh, became more poor and after that they have more blood, more blood people from all other planets? Um, that the Russians have become poorer and as a result that they they are uh, uh, envious of other people. Is that the, the, the idea? Yes, the idea that uh, before that was popular um, uh, phrase that Russians vote uh, because of their refrigerator. They want to uh, not think about anything about the food and about that something they have a, a little bit money but now they became poor poor but uh, uh, that um, uh, another way to uh, have russians in power uh, to give them idea about to uh, uh, the deaths yes of people this is on the, planet. Yeah, i see what you mean yeah, the, the point is that, but this has always been the way it is in Russia. People were poor, they understood they were poor, but they said, well, we were part of a great state. And we, and most of all, we are able to make, make people afraid of us. We are able to dominate others. We make, you know, we are uh, ready for war. Uh, and those cowards in the West are not ready for war. Uh, and, uh, Yes, indeed, the the uh, the mentality of Russia is such that there's a huge temptation to resort to war to boost the popularity of a regime, because under those circumstances, the reaction of the population will be very positive, uh, not just to the improvement in living standards, but to the war that's generating them. And that's what we're seeing now. I mean, the the soldiers are being very well paid. Their their families receive death benefits on their behalf that are, by Russian standards, very generous. So uh, it's a situation, of course, in which uh, there are no winners, and certainly not the Russian people themselves. Uh, but uh, but it but it continues. Yes, unfortunately, and I want to make step back and ask you about the chances Putin uh, 
in which conditions Putin will be finally thrown out from the club of presidents. Uh, after all, he has created more than one uh, uh, numbers of cheating, making his zero term, and uh, this election seems like a parody. Uh, if Putin is considered illegitimate, will uh, this boost Russia complete isolation and increase, increase its aggression? Uh, I don't think it'll have much importance uh, because he's, he, there's already, already a warrant out for his arrest from the International Criminal Court. Yeah. Uh, they don't need it. They don't need, you know, and in fact, the whole idea of calling uh, uh, Putin a, a usurper is flawed in my view, because it's, it, you know, usually people refer to these these elections that we've just had. But the reality is that Yel uh, that Putin has been uh, a usurper from the very first day. He's There never was a day, not a single day in which the Putin regime was legitimate. He came to power through an act of terror against his own people. And this is the apartment bombings, which I talk about in my book, uh, one of my books. And so under those circumstances, no, I don't think that uh, we're going to see uh, uh... Much, much of an effect, much of an effect from this uh, calling uh, Putin a usurper. Uh, we should go back and say that that he came to power through an act of terrorism, and he's conducted himself accordingly ever since. Yes, uh, exactly. But uh, why I wanted to ask you about the uh, illegitimation, because uh, 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 some weeks ago, Russian Duma suddenly decided to pass the law that Crimea had been illegally given to Ukraine. Uh, but previously, when they uh, have annexed Ukraine, <laughs> Crimea, they uh, didn't talk about that. Why they start uh, this uh, dialogue to need the help? Oh, well, this is uh, everything. Everything with them is post facto. Everything is post facto. The fact, you know, that in two thousand and two, at a press conference with Leonid Kravchuk. Uh, Putin said that was asked, uh, "What is your attitude about Ukraine tr joining NATO?" And he said, the, the "Ukraine's an independent country; it can do any whatever it wants." Uh, in 1994, Russia promised in the Budapest agreements to protect the 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 territory and the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And they they started violating it immediately afterward. So no, it's um, it's not a, a problem to go and 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 speak to other countries that are facing this kind of pressure, and reminding them that uh, uh, y you know Putin changes ch rewrites history every day in accordance with what it what what it is he considers to be in his interest. The other important thing is that the words that are written in the treaties are don't have any meaning. They don't make any sense because the Russian idea of truth is very distorted. The truth in Russia is whatever serves the regime. It's not truth per se. So, I mean, why would anyone want to put faith in a treaty signed with such people? Yes, and uh, about that, uh, that um, Russia has always been ruled by the KGB. Of course, you know it in your self uh, experience yeah, and, uh, when you <laughs> lived in Moscow. And uh, in past, they used their spices uh, to work with Western politician leaders to lower their vigilance, uh, to make some friendship with them, uh, to pre preventing that the Russian is democratic country. And uh, finally, the world has begun to suspect that something's been uh, wrong with that. But what about that uh, technique now, about the Russian sleeper cells now? How they are acting? I mean, how they see themselves? Uh, is, how is they are acting you're... in the West? In this... uh, well, in the West, uh, they are becoming very belligerent, of course. They are trying to, well, they're t it's twofold. They're trying to propagandize the West to say Russia is a Christian country. 
uh, Russia persecutes gays or prosecutes gays. Ukraine uh, is allying itself with the LGBT group. Uh, they, but th they try to, to convince those Americans who are ready to listen that this country, which has invaded its sovereign neighbor, uh, which has launched a whole series of aggressive wars and in which human life has no value, is actually a highly Christian country for propaganda purposes. And they've been they've been repeating that, you know, for uh, for some time. But at the at the same time, they've gone, you know, they've escalated the threats against the West, including the threats to use nuclear weapons. So, uh, you know, they are they are working hard to achieve their objects through intimidation or th and threats, or through somehow uh, suborning the uh, the Western leaders who who are not directly in, involved with politics, but nonetheless have interests, have influence. Yes, and. Um... What is your opinion about why did Putin asserted that he had agreed to exchange Navalny? Uh, what signal did Navalny death give to the West? I mean, what? Uh, well, the the signal is, is the same signal that the uh, murder of Alexander Litvinenko gave, that the murder of Anna Politkovskaya gave, that the murder of Boris Nemtsov gave. Uh, that Putin will just murder anyone who tries to challenge his power. But, of course, they create all kinds of cover stories, and people in the West who don't want to face the reality, they can take, they can use the cover story. But, they can, uh, and and, and use, it, use it as an excuse for doing nothing. But in this, um, in this case, um, Putin played a very keen game. They say, oh, I was very open for the West. I wanted to exchange Navalny. But after that, <clears throat> sorry, he was dead. No, they want, yeah. I mean, this is a lie, probably. I mean, he, uh, you know, he, he his offer to exchange Navalny for a criminal assassin who carried out an attack on a, on a former uh, Russian citizen uh, in Berlin, it just indicates that this is a criminal regime that you know seek, kidnaps people from the West and exchanges them for their own criminals. Uh, but the um, you know even if such talks were taking place, uh, it it you know it would be a it would be quite a disgrace actually to have exchanged uh navalny for you know just another so a russian murderer uh or an assassin uh you know it's a very unequal trade and navalny is a russian citizen who should be protected by his own government not by the governments of countries abroad but um I don't believe that they they were seriously planning to exchange him. I think that's a cover story. I think that that they had decided they were going to murder him, and they did. Yes, and um, to be to talk about more global questions, in two months, Putin will meet with uh, China leader, and what should we expect from this talk? After all, uh, there are those who believe that Russia has long been a vassal of China because it has leased a land to them on a long-term basis. But uh, in another version, there are the, uh, those who see China and Russia as unequal players. What is your opinion about Well, I, we, we, don't, we don't, I mean, the, a lot will depend on what, what the West is willing to do. I mean, the, the big source of strength of Russia is their ability to sell their oil and gas. And if we can put an end to that, we can put an end to the war. But that requires economic sacrifice. As long as Russia is able to sell its gas and oil to China or to India, uh, it will have the money it needs to keep up the war. So, you know, how can we prevent that? Well, we can impose secondary sanctions 
we can impose sanctions on the countries that are not cooperating with the sanctions regime and on the contrary subverting it by by trading with uh, with Russians. Yes, but why Putin wanna talk with Xi Jinping, with China's leader now? Well, we don't know what what's going to come up in the uh, discussions uh, in in Beijing, uh, but I suppose that uh, Putin is anxious for more Chinese military and technical support. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you think uh, he will use it for Ukrainian war or in the war in the territory of uh, the EU? Because uh, how likely is it attack to the Baltic states? Uh, uh, because now we talk about this uh, uh, where, uh, option and uh, when and how it could take place. How likely is it? Uh, well, it, it uh, we can say that under Yeltsin in the early 90s, so that's 30 years ago, they were already complaining about the treatment of Russian speakers in the Baltic republics. And they issued a national security doctrine which said that Russia is obliged to defend Russian speakers wherever they are in the world. Uh, the, uh, the, the mentioning of supposed discrimination against Russians in in uh, the Baltic republics was uh, was deliver deliberate, and it reflected an attempt to create a basis for future aggression, an excuse for uh, attacking in the future. So the problem is not uh, in the only the Putin's region and before. Every time the Russian leaders thinking about something with annexation. Well, the um, I think the immediate goal is to subjugate Ukraine, and if they fail in that goal, uh, they will not threaten NATO. Uh, if they succeed in subjugating Ukraine then uh, there is a danger that they, the next step will be to try to create a crisis over you know russian speakers somewhere in the in in nato in the, perhaps in the baltic republics and you know even if they we we create a situation in which even if they don't attack they have free reign to create enormously high levels of tension with their behavior even if there is no attack no direct attack. Yeah, and uh, what can we expect from Lukashenko in this situation? Does uh, he remain an independent figure, or he is for the uh, moment kind because of... he he cooperates he cooperates with the Russians, and for the moment they tolerate him. But I don't think that an you know if there's no independent Ukraine, I'm assuming there will not be an independent Belarus. Yes, absolutely agree. Absolutely agree. And our uh, uh, people who from Belarus who um, inside the Paul Kalinovskova, do you know that probably? Yeah. Uh, who take part in Ukrainian war on our side, they every time uh, uh, talk about that we uh, started uh, with uh, free of all Ukraine and after that, that will be the free Belarus. Uh, at the end, I wanted to ask you about that intrusive taste is that the West is afraid of Russian collapse into independent states because it doesn't know what might be happen after that. But what could be happen after Russia will be collapsed? What could be the scenario? Well, I mean, uh, it might mean that uh, a more pro-Western leader would 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 emerge if they when you say Russia Russia, we're not talking about Russia collapsing. We're talking about the Putin regime collapsing, because those are two different things. If the Putin regime collapses under the pressure of the war and Russia is there, uh, the, whoever becomes to power may choose to pursue a pro-Western policy. Uh, because after all, I mean, any person with normal common sense will understand that Russia cannot really progress economically if it doesn't have trade ties 
and technical assistance from the West. So that's that. That's one thing. I think that um, on the other hand, there could be chaos. There could be an ultra-nationalist dictatorship. Uh, there's some parts of the what is now the Russian, uh, it's called the Russian Federation, although it's not a federation if you don't elect the local gov governors. But anyway, the the in some cases, uh, you know, people there are uh, are fanatical, and they will, uh, you know, they will, they will support an ongoing ongoing war, or they will support a war against their own people, a kind of civil war. And they were they're capable of launching it. I mean, you know, we have to understand what's happened sociologically in Russia. Thousands and thousands of criminals have been given handed guns and told that they're heroes and had their punishment, their their jail terms canceled. Now, those that survived came, you know, come back and they commit they commit crimes, intimidating everybody. And they've had an, a lot of experience of seeing people turned into corpses. Yes, and so is it true that West is afraid of Russia collapse? So that's why. Is it true that um, that the West is afraid of a Russia Russian collapse? Well, I don't think that that's the number one fear right now. The number one fear is that that uh, Russia is massing troops and. Uh, uh, and Russia and Ukraine might not be able to to withstand them. We don't, you know, we don't know. I mean, if Russia collapses, basically, it's going to be uh, a problem that we'll deal with when it when it arises. But we shouldn't make our policy in order to prevent a Russian collapse. We should make a policy to engineer put the Putin regime's defeat. I think that's where what what we need to do. But if you are not mistaken, in your books, you talk about that Yeltsin regime will not uh, uh, so democratic because he started the war in Echkeria, Chechnya, and uh, other else. So do you really believe that Russia could uh, change with another leader? Uh, that's an interesting question because... Uh, we've seen how Russia changed, how the Soviet Union changed, for example, after Stalin died and Khrushchev began reforms. The, if they want to avoid becoming a satellite of China, they're going to have to make changes. And those changes could only be made by a, a leader who comes after Putin. Uh, Putin himself will not make those changes. So uh, I think that... Uh, Nothing can be ruled out. Let's face it, Russia today is far different from what it was in the days of the Soviet Union. It's, uh, it is it is uh, a country now in which there is a middle class, in which there are people who are educated, in which they do have information and access to information if they want that, inf if they want that information. And I think that... Uh, uh, if those people gain a critical weight in the overall political situation, then uh, anything is possible. You know, they could they could put an end to the war. They could uh, try to reestablish ties with the West. But um, but you know, could they come to power? Could such relatively moderate, enlightened people come to power? It's hard, very hard to say because the people who are in power now do not fit that do not fit that description. Uh, to be honest, uh, your version that Russia, uh, in all odds, uh, might be uh, the vassal of China, be under their power, is more likely. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, the the um, China and Russia are not natural partners, because China has has a claim on huge sections of Russian territory, and a claim that's, by the way, more persuasive than the claim of the Russians to dominate Ukraine. 